Well, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, welcome to the first IPA Power Hour webinar of 2023 on equitable solar workforce development. We are glad you are here today. My name is Mega Hamal, and I am the Senior Communications Manager for the Illinois Power Agency, and I will be responsible for hosting the session. To kick off this webinar, let's go over some housekeeping items. To reduce any background noise, all participants are muted upon entry. We've also <clears throat> enabled live captioning for the webinar today, and we'll be taking questions from our audience towards the end. So please feel free to submit any questions at any time during the webinar. To submit questions, please use the chat feature at the bottom of the Zoom window. Today's session is being recorded. A recorded version of this session will be available on the IPA website under About Us events. Couple of points that I would like to emphasize. This webinar is for a general education purpose only and does not represent a legal interpretation or statement of policy by um, the IPA or its staff. Now, without further ado, I would like to introduce our esteemed speakers for this session. Our first speaker for the session is Delmar Gillis, Chief Operating Officer of Elevate, a nonprofit based in Chicago that designs and implements programs to ensure that everyone has clean and affordable heat, power, and water in their homes and communities. Elevate is also the program administrator for Illinois Solar for All, IPA's income eligible solar program. As the COO, Delmar is responsible for implementing operational workforce development and project management processes for Elevate's clean energy projects. Delmar is a champion and advocate for equity in the clean energy industry. He played a critical role in passing Illinois' Climate and Equitable Jobs Act, CETA. In today's presentation, Delmar will discuss solar workforce development from an equity lens and will provide an overview on FIJA and CJA's role in promoting equitable solar workforce development here in Illinois. Welcome, Delmar. Um, I, I want to see if Crystal joined. Um, looks like she joined because she is our next speaker. So our next speaker is Crystal Hansley, founder and CEO of We Solar, a community solar company providing affordable energy to low and moderate income families. Crystal is also the nation's first African American CEO in the community solar industry. Previously, Crystal has worked as program manager for the US Senate Democratic Diversity Initiative. In addition, she served as Majority Leader Harry Reid's liaison and then continued her work empowering constituents with legislative support in the office of Congresswoman Eleanor Holmes Norton. Outside of work, Crystal is a classically trained concert pianist and a mezzo-soprano opera singer. Welcome, Crystal. In today's presentation, Crystal will shed some light on federal policies and initiatives that are aimed at advancing equitable solar workforce development. Our next speaker for the session is Sarah Duffy, Deputy Legal Counsel at the IPA. In this role, she aids in the development and preparation of procurement plans for the agency. In addition, she assists in researching and formulating guidance on legal issues and le legislation impacting the agency or the industry in which the agency operates. Prior to joining the IPA, Sarah worked as a North American Government Affairs Manager for the Under Two Coalition, a global network of state and regional governments leading on climate action. She previously worked for Georgetown Climate Center and for the Emmett Institute on Climate Change and Environmental Law at the UCLA School of Law. Welcome, Sarah. Sarah will discuss how state policies are advancing equitable solar workforce development specific to the IPA's programs and procurements. Our last speaker for the session is Lisa Jones, Senior Policy Manager for Federal and State Funded Workforce Programs in the Office of Employment and Training at the Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. 
In this role, Lisa not only focuses on policy development for the workforce and education, but is involved in service and program development for underserved populations. She has been instrumental in infusing equity into project management tools that remove barriers to employment. Lisa will discuss FIJA and CJA's workforce, CJA workforce training programs and discuss DCEO's role in all of this. Uh, <clears throat> just a quick overview on the Power Hour. Power Hour, there are a series of educational and informative webinars. Um, that basically discusses a wide range of energy issues, emerging issues. Um, you know, just a fun fact, uh, we started this power hour in October of 2021. And to date, we have hosted um, about 18 webinars to date. This is the next upcoming webinar, which will be taking place on March 31st. So if you have not registered yet, please do so uh, from um, the presentation directly, or you can also do that from the IPA web website under About Us events. For those that are new to the uh, Power Hour webinar, just a quick overview on the Illinois Power Agency. We are an independent state agency created in 2007 by Illinois law. Our responsibilities include developing and implementing procurement plans for electric supply for utility customers. We're also involved in developing and implementing solar incentive programs here in Illinois and implementing the renewable portfolio standard and conducting competitive procurements for utility scale projects. With that, I want to welcome our first speaker, um, Delmar, to discuss what the equitable solar workforce development looks like. Delmar. All right. Well, thank you very much, Mega. It is a, a great honor to be on today. And I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we're going to have. Uh, next slide, please. So what I'd like to talk about is just how do Fiji and Sija, what they are doing to create a clean and equitable future for Illinois. And I'm gonna tie kind of some national context into that so that we can see how the big picture is impacting Illinois. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, I wanted to take a look at kind of what's going on big picture and then start to drill down into um, what's happening at a, a state and local level as it relates to uh, job creation and equity. As Mega mentioned, um, I work for an organization called Elevate and my primary role is chief operating officer um, but uh, more recently, I have been asked to support the Illinois Clean Jobs Coalition and was one of the in-room negotiators um, for the equity provisions that are within CJA. Uh, one of the things that CJA tried to do was to make sure that programs are, especially clean energy programs are implemented equitably. One of the things that I often said in the room was that we all breathe the same air, drink the same water and use the same energy resources. And if we're going to address our climate issues, we have to do it in a holistic, uh, inclusive way. Um, just focusing on uh, affluent communities or affluent countries is not gonna help us meet our climate goals and ultimately it puts our planet at risk. So coming up with strategies and policies that engage everyone in that discussion are critically important. So some of the, the big picture items that are going on or uh, legislative and policy priorities are going on are kind of covered in this slide. Um, as you can see, the two big hitters that I'm sure many of us are familiar with are the bipartisan infrastructure package that was passed in November of 2021 as well as the Inflation Reduction Act, which has over $370 billion of climate solutions built in, much of which will be focused on solar and creating an equitable workforce. So when you start to look at these numbers and the amount of investment that the US is making on top of state investment and private investment, you really start to see that 
there is a real focus on uh, addressing our climate challenges, but also, and very importantly, there's a focus on doing this in an equitable way. One of the key premises that the federal government is using that I'd like to highlight, and I'll put some notes in the chat after I wrap up um, and also get them to Mega so that she can provide them, is a program called Justice 40. And it's basically a premise that 40% of the resources that are invested, especially in clean energy, are focused on underserved and marginalized communities and also 40% of the jobs that spend the incentives are also focused on underserved communities. One of the other resources, in addition to Justice 40, which you can easily Google as well, if you put justice and then four zero, all one word, um, the program comes up as well as other programs like Elevate's Justice 40 Accelerator to get a feel for the types of initiatives. The other resource that I really like to highlight is the solar job census. And thank you, Mega, for putting a link on my slide uh, to that document. Um, basically what this document does is highlight um, where we are at a national level as it relates to job creation, equity, and opportunities. So for instance, one of the things that you'll see in this report is that in 2021, um, there are over 255,000 jobs at 29,000 sites across all 50 states. And that number is a 9% increase from 2021. Considering that we're coming out of a COVID economy, um, showing that level of growth and that level of labor participation is critically important. Um, one of the things that you'll also see as you look over the solar census are things like most of the jobs are being created in the installation and project development areas, um, where once again, there's roughly 9% growth. Um, the solar industry also employs three times as many workers as the coal industry and is third uh, as it relates to energy industry jobs. So you're starting to see an increase in the work that's done in the solar space with a lot of focus now on development and installation. On the equity side, one of the challenges that we see is only 31% of the firms have reported having a strategy on how to create an equitable workforce within their organization. So there's still a lot of work to be done as it relates to building equity into the work and creating community-based economic development opportunities. Next slide, please. So how does all of that translate into CJA and the work that was done in FIJA? Um, this is probably one of my favorite slides that the Clean Jobs Coalition put together because it really shows what uh, CJA was trying to do and FIJA before it. When you look at this slide, what you see is you see community groups, you see youth, you see legislators, you see environmental organizations, you see organized labor, um, and you see people of all different races, ethnicities, and backgrounds. CJA wasn't about one particular viewpoint driving the day. It was about listening and it was about trying to find the solution that's going to get Illinois to the climate and clean energy future that we all want. And one of the things that makes me most proud as a uh, primary uh, participant in this process is that we listen to all voices, we work collaboratively, and we came up with some legislation that arguably is a nation leader in how you implement equitable solutions. Next. So what exactly is CJA and what are its component parts? Um, I don't have enough time to do a deep dive drill down into all of these. Uh, as I mentioned, one of my primary roles in the process was focusing on equity and really making sure that there wasn't just a carve out section that focused on equity, but that equity was throughout the bill. So in the 950 plus pages of CJA, 
I can honestly say that there are equitable provisions in almost every section. And there was a theme across the board of how do we engage those who often do not have a voice in the process. So whether you're looking at jobs and economic development, utility accountability, um, grid planning, low income relief, just transition for fossil fuel communities, electric transportation, et cetera, all of these sections took the perspective of what is the impact of this legislation on underserved and marginalized communities. Next. So what exactly does this look like? Um, once again, there was a strong focus on equity. Um, you can see the 40% number um, that's here. Um, I would like to have a friendly debate maybe with some on whether we originated that from our conversations or we got it from the feds, but ultimately um, there is a consensus that we need to make sure that equity is ingrained in everything that we're working on and doing. Because once again, if we're going to solve our climate challenges, we have to make sure we're bringing everybody along because there is a lot of uh, climate challenges in underserved communities that without funding, without support would not be addressed appropriately. So we have to make sure we're making investments in those communities as well. Um, when you start looking at the numbers in CJ, you really start to see the scope and magnitude of the investment where there's over $82 million per year invested in workforce development, contractor equity programs, and that doesn't include a lot of the support programs as well as a lot of the just, just transition programs. So that number quickly starts to increase. Next slide. And the next one. So I'm just gonna focus on just touching on some of the workforce um, components. And what I'm gonna do is just talk about some of the why and the what um, Lisa later is going to dive into the details of how these programs work, so I do not want to um, kind of steal her thunder, but what I would like to do is talk about the approach we use to come up with these. And the first place that you always have to start is a definition and having some consensus around what equity is and what equity is going to accomplish. And this is probably one of the best definitions that I've seen that I got from Adrian um, when I was on a, a workforce task force with him uh, for the state of Illinois. And I'll read this very quickly. It says, in an equitable workforce, race, ethnicity, gender, and other demographic characteristics no longer predict one's outcome in the labor market. All people have equitable access to jobs that are safe, pay a living wage, offer benefits, provide career pathways, and opportunities for mobility. The workforce, both public and private, is representative of the general population at all different levels of skill and pay across occupational groups and sectors. Our strategies are systemic so that equity is permanent. And that last line is something that's really important to me, especially working on policy and supporting uh, organizations and government agencies like the IPA, DCEO, uh, Illinois EPA, as well as the federal um, or um, agencies, is that they have to, we have to make systemic change that focuses on equity in order for those changes to stick. Next. Next slide, please. So you're going to see this slide later, so I'm not going to talk about the content of this slide. But what I really loved about this slide is that it really focuses on what we're trying to do. We wanted to make sure that with the thousands of jobs or tens, if not hundreds of thousands of jobs that are going to be created, that we are focusing on developing um, the workers that do this work, as well as supporting workers that are transitioning from other um, areas of emphasis and focus. And so it's critically important that we not just train people, but that we develop them and create them career opportunities. And so Lisa's going to dive into this in a lot more detail than I am. But fundamentally, we have training programs, we have support programs, 
And we focus on both workers as well as businesses, as well as those that are being displaced or in those that are wanting to transition from other lines of work. Next slide. Another focus is that we want to bring the training to the communities and not have communities have to come to the training. One of the things that we learned from the Future Energy Jobs Act or FEJA was that we needed to do a better job of ensuring the training reached all parts of the state and that everyone had access. So there's been a creation of 13 workforce hubs primarily in underserved and high impact communities. And there's also three pre-apprenticeship programs that focus on creating union opportunities for those that want to follow that track. This slide highlights where those hubs are going to be located. And once again, Lisa will get into the specifics of the programs, but fundamentally we have programs to support the workforce or those looking for jobs and careers. And then on the next slide, the opportunities focus on contractors, which is building capacity, especially with diverse contractors so that they can get access to projects and opportunities. And on the bottom of the slide, you'll also notice that there's a focus on prevailing wage support because we wanna make sure that everybody gets paid a fair wage and has access to benefits. Next slide. So I'm gonna to just touch on renewable energy for a second, since I know that we're all on to, to discuss solar. Um, and this is a graph of solar in the state of Illinois and what Siege is looking to accomplish. And as you can see, um, we pretty much started out um, really kind of hovering around the zero 0.2%. Um, we implemented FIJA and you start to see a significant increase uh, in the solar capacity and the amount of power generated by um, solar. And what CEDA is, is striving to do is to basically take us from the 9% that we're close to now and get us closer to 50% um, as we start approaching 2045 and 2050. So you can see both from FIJA by the numbers that I shared earlier, as well as the goals and the work that agencies like the IPA are doing, we have a significant goal. What's important about this slide, as well as those of you who are interested, if you look in the solar um, census document on page 13, there's a similar graph. What it shows is the amount of investment that's being made in solar. So when you hear people talking about, well, hey, these opportunities are gonna come and go, and you're gonna train people, they're gonna get one job, and then they're gonna be jobless. When you start thinking about what the state of Illinois needs to do to get from 9% to 50, and then to be able to sustain that and potentially increase it, you're looking at some significant job growth, you're looking at significant investment, and to support this, it requires a significant well-trained workforce. And that's part of the purpose of the equity provisions and the workforce programs that Lisa will cover later. Next slide. So I just wanna wrap up with some, what I felt were important observations and lessons learned from being part of the CJA negotiating team. Um, and these are things that I either uh, observed firsthand or uh, received a lot of feedback and input from, especially community members who are central to doing these types of programs. Um, I just mentioned the, the first one, which is high growth industries like clean energy have high potential for successful outcomes. The state of Illinois is literally investing hundreds of millions of dollars. And when you couple that with in private, with private investment, there's going to be over a billion dollars a year invested in clean energy. And that doesn't even include all of the federal dollars that uh, were on that earlier slide, which I believe added up to close to $2 trillion across the US. So when you start looking at the amount of investment, it's gonna be an area where if you're in this space, if you're focused on equity, you really have a lot of opportunity. Um, it's important to center equity up front. Um, 
gone are the days where there's large investments and then there's like a, a carve out for black and brown communities and creating a small corner of jobs. The focus now is on saving the planet, doing it in an inclusive way, creating community-based economic development opportunities and making sure that the jobs and the opportunities are available to everyone. Focus on jobs and retention. Oftentimes we wanna focus on training and we wanna focus on certificates. What we wanna focus on via CJA, and I know the IPA has this focus as well, is on jobs, on projects, and on maintaining those opportunities and growing them via retention. It's critically important that we not just look at this as we have to do these training programs or, you know, we're, we're, we're just looking to hire people for a project. Um, in order to get the 50%, we have a lot that we need to accomplish. The next one is progress has been made, but there's still work to be done with organized labor and communities of color. Um, one of the things that we tried to focus on with CJA is how do we increase engagement of communities of color in organized labor and create opportunities to uh, have access to jobs, have access to leadership roles, and to have a very inclusive, comfortable environment for all. Um, I'm very excited about the work that organized labor is doing with our partner Hire 360, um, as well as a lot of the work um, that folks like China Hampton and Pat Devaney uh, and Joe Duffy and others are doing to diversify uh, the work that unions do. So there's a lot of opportunities now uh, within organized labor to uh, begin to uh, increase participation amongst communities of color. Um, I mentioned the last one, which is it's not just about training. Our future workforce needs support systems. Once again, it's not just about plopping somebody in a seat in a training room, but it's understanding the person. Do they need help with transportation or funding or other um, barriers that have prevented them from engaging? CJA provides relief on many of these barriers so that we can increase our participation rate. Next slide. And this is my last content slide. Um, and I'll just tick through these quickly. Uh, address longstanding processes that limit access and create inequality. It's great to have this great policy environment that we're in with a lot of funding, but ultimately it comes down to do the regulations, do the rules, do the, are the communications, are the processes to implement put in place that engage underserved and marginalized individuals? And are they done in an equitable way? If you post jobs in locations where women aren't looking for work, you're not gonna get a lot of women applying for the opportunity. So are we putting job postings in places where underserved community members, where African Americans and Latinos and Asian Americans and indigenous individuals are gonna be looking for jobs and if we don't know where those places are, are we engaging with those communities to ask these questions? Support our government agencies. Um, oftentimes you hear people complaining about this agency doesn't do this and it's not doing that. I wanna flip the script and have us reach out and ask the agencies, what do they need to help them implement these programs? What I've seen from the IPA and from DCEO is they've really worked hard to do more community engagement, to get more input. I, I've seen firsthand how these agencies have taken that input and then made changes to programs to make them more usable for businesses and communities. And so I would just challenge many of us that have been overly critical to take a step back and ask a different question, which is how can I help? Um, kind of bringing it home, accountability, we're trying to get from nine to 50. So to get from 9% to 50, we need to have metrics, we need good reporting, and we need accountability. CJA brings that in, but I'm asking everyone on this phone that works in this space to help with that. Um, what is your organization doing to make sure that we're reaching our shared goals? Haven't talked a lot about just transition other than to mention um, that the solar jobs are now, what did I say? It's like twice as many as coal jobs. There's a lot of coal displaced workers in the state of Illinois. 
are we training them? Are we prepping them? Are we working with their communities to make the shift to battery technology, to solar, to wind? CJ has some built-in tools to do that, but we all need to partner. It's not just about getting more solar, it's about bringing everybody along. And for a displaced worker and his or her family, that's critical. So we need to make sure that we're helping everybody. And some of the tools in CJ will help with that. And then lastly, I'm just a really big proponent of we have to work together. So I'm looking forward to coordinating, partnering, and working with everyone on this call to make sure that we create a future in the clean energy economy that is equitable and beneficial to all communities. Thank you everyone for an opportunity to speak about equity. Um, thank you, Mega, for an opportunity to share, and I look forward to questions at the end. Thanks, Delmar. Now I would like to invite Crystal Hensley, CEO and founder at We Solar, to talk about federal support around this topic. Crystal? Yes, thank you. Oh, man, I have to follow that. <laughs> On Delmar, that information was very useful, and I look forward to reaching out to you and seeing how we Solar can um, work with other Illinois-based organizations, inner city, Chicago. Um, we Solar just recently hired our um, Illinois program manager to lead community solar development um, and start our team for acquisition. We recently partnered with Chicago-based 548 Capital to help with their community solar um, portfolio. So I'm really excited about our work in Illinois that's um, for this year. Uh, the end of this year and, and into the future. So hello everyone, my name is Crystal Hansley and I founded We Solar, a community solar development company out of Baltimore, Maryland. Um, just like my intro um, stated, I have about 10 years in federal policy working on Capitol Hill with the United States Senate, former Senate Democratic leader here, Reid, as well as some congressional house members. Um, I. Uh, leverage my policy background and went into the renewable space as a uh, government a director and community for a local community solar um, startup. And so that's when I joined the private sector because I was seeing like the national, the, the state policies at the time, um, federal was behind. Um, and I saw how, you know, you didn't really need to have like the traditional I would say engineering or STEM background because from a policy wonk myself, I just thought the STEM field was always intimidating. And for um, other inspiring entrepreneurs, people say, how did you get into this space? Did you need to major in this? No, I say um, what Delmar was saying, there's jobs and solar everywhere. So whether you're accounting, whether you're sales, it doesn't really matter. Just jump in because the field needs all skills. Um, and that's what I did, um, just leveraging my background, um, joined the startup, rolled up my, my sleeves because there's always work that can um, be done and it's needed and your skills are very useful to an emerging space like solar. And so we solar, we focus on this latest vertical in solar, meaning that you do not have to own um, your own roof or you do not need to put a physical system on a building, you can tap into a virtual power plant and receive that uh, solar credit directly on your bill. At the moment, there's about 22 states that have, um, I would say, a developer operated community solar model. Um, there's about 40 plus community solar versions, whether if you look at Florida, um, some, in, some other Southeast um, states, they have like a vertically integrated um, community solar model where there is community solar, it has the savings component, um, but there's, you know, just different policies that, you know, it's just all different. Um, and most recently, there's a lot of, um, I would say, incentives at the federal level that's really magnifying community solar. Um, the deal we announced that there's this I want to say they want to get to uh, by 2030 a 700 million dollar increase, or I think they want to see about 700 <laughs> seven gigawatts of community solar in the next three years, um, which is uh, a 700 percent increase. So that's 
that's that's a big uh, I would say interval and we need everyone on this call and states and folks who are looking how they can get into the green space, I would say one is um, community solar. And so what we decided to do when I founded the business um, was to leverage my own background with my previous startup and just jump in and doing the sales and marketing because there's a lack of like, I would say cultural competency um, that was in the space. There was just no diversity. And so how are you going to sell virtual solar to underrepresented communities when no one on your team looks like the communities that you're doing outreach in and um, the terms that you're using, the language that you're using doesn't, it's not applicable and you have to meet people where they are. So I saw that as um, an opportunity to start a company because I believe that my skill set can bridge the communication gaps that was needed to really get community solar off the ground in LMI communities. And then most recently, I um, started to work with other developers in the space um, through JVs and partnerships to where now we're also, where I believe the real equity is, um, is on the development side. And we're one of the first women black owned um, firms that's actually developing as well as doing our own acquisition. Next slide. So as I stated, um, here's the real opportunity now, and it's also speaking from um, one of Delmar's previous slide that had about close to over $300 um, billion for clean um, solar. And part of that was in the uh, 48E section of the Inflation Reduction Act that really talked about the ITC credits. And you're gonna see a lot of, um, I would say rhetoric and language and opportunities and new startups um, that saying, hey, we wanna do solar and we really wanna maximize these ITC credits because now you're able to, instead of just having the 30% ITC credits, now you can, if you're low income, if you're part of an energy community means, if you're um, coal community, you can now get a 10% adder. And then also if you're, um, if you're within an underrepresented community or if you're a new business, a new market entry, if you're a WMBE, then you can also get additional um, adders, which makes your project even more profitable. So um, around that, the um, Department of Treasury, most recently last week, um, my company submitted comments in favor of the guidance. Um, so when you have a chance, um, if someone can link it in below, um, the, the new interpretation, and in it, it stated that the window for the ITC credits will be released this fall. So anyone that's planning on developing community solar, and we, we talked about equity, um, I think the IPA um, is onto something, but when you really look at those who are of color, um, we still have a long ways to go. I think it was less than you know 1% or even, I don't know how many, um, black and minority owned developers are able to take um, advantage of the program thus far. And so um, because of the hurdles around like actual development and financing and the knowledge. Um, and so even what I think the, the program itself is amazing, um, there's these, these gaps of just talent and just training for like the actual modeling and developing sites. And so at the Fed level, they have the Community Power Accelerator um, that's looking to connect with underrepresented um, community groups and community leaders, economic development corporations um, to help them to, to fill in this gap, um, exactly why some state um, pilots are just falling short of like, hey, we got everything right, like why the numbers are still not, as you know, ideal as we want, or what can we do? So that was just some of the feedback saying, hey, we need some more development training, and this is one of the tools. And um, I would say programs that's helping folks um, get, you know, solve one of those problems. As well as the Community Power Accelerator Prize, it's still open um, for, you know, folks that have like nonprofits and churches, and they typically need a few partners, which I think is a great way to cross collaborate and share ideas. Um, and just spread the resources out across like, and you know, folks that have similar missions, but you're not recreating the will. Um, 
I think we should all be applying if we have like the capacity, that's also a problem. But if we link that to what other state um, programs are doing saying, hey, we can help with capacity building, here's the opportunities. And then this is how I see some of state and federal um, programs actually uh, build off of each other. And so those deadlines are coming up. And for the Community Power Accelerator Prize, um, the deadline is uh, March 1st. Next slide. Okay, and so another avenue um, that I've been seeing in the space currently, um, some of the CCSAs, the Community Solar Association, um, as well as a lot of nonprofits, they're also um, tapping into this um, EPA Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund. Um, there's about 66 grants that's associated with this um, fund right now. It's a one-time grant. So for those who have I, like programs and proposals, please look into this um, because it's very wide in scope. Um, and I believe that this is the language when you really look at it is for us, is for inner city, is for minorities, is for women, is for small businesses, is for nonprofits. Um, and especially if you cross collaborate with multiple groups, so you don't have to recreate the will, um, definitely put your, uh, your, your bids in and look out for this. Next slide, I have one more last slide. And so here's a, a, a little bit about the ITC low income bonus credit that I talked about um, and how it's broken up. Um, and the guidance again was just released. So if you take a moment um, and check out like treasuries and how like they're looking to interpret those ITC credits, you will see that there's a carve out for community solar, there's a carve out for rooftop solar. So one group don't eat the other and, and max it out before another one even had time to do like interconnection or uh, even get their uh, permitting and stuff done. So I really like that each like uh, ITC credit has been carved out for its own category. Um, what I really would like to show is that the extra um, additional criteria, which is kind of like the fine print, because um, there's been some back and forth on what's an economic benefit and how can we actually uh, uh, make sure that we can get this credit or other folks, bad actors aren't just using our language, but also like you know, not really equitable. They're really going to hone in on small businesses. They're really looking for new market entrants. So those who've never built before, you would actually um, meet these additional criteria, which was literally just released. So any new folks that's trying to understand this space and, you know, just want to jump in, here's your opportunity and here's uh, the tax incentives that's actually, you know, you can take your proposal, go to your green bank, um, you know, join the community solar development uh, training groups, like I stated in the, in the previous slide, um, and roll up your sleeves. And just like we solar, I didn't have any previous um, development experience, or I wasn't an engineer by trade, um, but I leveraged my community, I leveraged the policy, I leveraged um, the accelerators and also the free um, programs to help me get around this and understanding the policy. And yeah, um, that that's in drive. <laughs> so I have I'm here if you have any additional questions as far as like community solar um, and how we can bring more community solar to your communities. Thank you, Crystal. <clears throat> Our next um, speaker is Sarah, who will be talking about state support um, to advance equitable solar workforce development as it relates to IPA programs and procurements. Sarah. Thanks, Mega, and thanks to Delmar and Crystal for really um, setting kind of the state and national context for all of this. I'm going to focus on what is um, happening at the IPA specifically. Um, within our uh, programs to incentivize solar. Um, so next slide. So um, we're gonna start with Solar for All. Um, for those who don't know, Solar for All is our program providing incentives to um, projects that serve uh, income eligible households and nonprofits and public facilities. 
So one uh, aspect of Solar for All that relates to everything that, that Delmar and Crystal talked about um, in terms of encouraging new entrants into this space, um, the Climate and Equal Jobs Act specifically called on Solar for All, um, both IPA and the program administrator, to ensure that small and emerging businesses um, are able to participate in Solar for All. What that looks like is that we are um, providing additional dedicated staff that um, within our program administrator at Elevate uh, Energy to focus specifically on supporting these smaller and um, newer approved vendors so that they can really uh, flourish in the program. We've also decided to focus on uh, employing or using small and emerging businesses for some of the pilot programs that were proposed in our last long-term plan and that are currently under development. Next slide, please. Another element of Illinois Solar for All that really um, uh, you know, kickstarts um, job development and um, training is the requirement that participants in the Solar for All program uh, actually hire job trainees for a certain number of their projects. So there's kind of two overlapping related requirements right now um, that apply to projects across all of the categories within Solar for All. One is that AVs, the, the approved vendors, have to hire job trainees um, from qualifying programs for a certain percentage of hours um, across their, their um, portfolio. Um, so this is this is about kind of the you know the percentage of work that is being done. And that percentage increases with the number of years that the vendor is in the program. So we're expecting them to hire more and more trainees as their business grows. A second um, requirement is that they also must hire at least one job trainee on at least a third of the projects in each category. So this is to kind of make sure that they are hiring trainees across their portfolio of projects and not just having a bunch of trainees work a bunch of hours on one project to satisfy that, that first requirement. Additionally, the Solar for All website has a catalog of all of the workforce training programs that qualify job trainees um, uh, that you can all check out. Next slide. So some of the, the equity requirements under CJA um, have already been covered in previous power hours. And given um, we have another speaker to get to, I'm gonna kind of breeze through these. Um, so please, if you have specific questions, um, put them in the chat. Um, but basically we are looking at um, kind of four major elements of our equity uh, requirements. Um, we have the actual um, kind of equity hiring requirements that are applied to adjustable block program and utility scale. We have the online um, database and portal that we were um, required to create. In the future, we will be conducting a racial disparity study of the entire clean energy economy. And then we're also doing these outreach to small and disadvantaged businesses. Next slide. So first I just, this is a lot of words, we're not gonna cover all of this. And again, this has been covered in previous presentations, but basically our, all of our equity um, quantitative requirements focus on equity eligible persons, which are defined as graduates of um, certain state uh, funded programs, workforce training programs, persons who were enrolled in the foster care system, persons who were formerly incarcerated, and person whose primary residence is in either an EJ or an R3 category. So both of those are defined in statute. Next slide. And then an equity eligible contractor is just a, comp a contractor company that is majority owned by those equity eligible persons. Next slide. Um, so the minimum equity standard is just a minimum percentage of the project workforce that must consist of those equity eligible persons. So this applies to all of the projects in our adjustable block program and to all of our utility scale wind, solar, and brownfield projects. 
Um, this is set at 10% for the this year. Um, that eventually will be increased um, by to 30% by 2030. Next slide. Um, additionally, we have a new reserve set of uh, capacity within the adjustable block program that is only available to those equity eligible contractors. Um, it provides the ability to get some of the capital um, up front to address some of the barriers that those um, those actors might face in um, getting uh, loans or financing. Um, and it also uh, is going to start at 10% of the capacity for ABP and grow to 40% by 2030. Next slide. Um, so this equity portal, this is one of the requirements um, in CJA. Um, we launched it on January 31st. It is essentially um, a uh, kind of database portal platform um, where vendors, potential workers, workforce training program um, managers, and anyone else who's interested in all of the information that I'm discussing today can go to find out more. Um, you can go there to register as or get certified as an equity eligible person um, or as an equity eligible contractor. You can find out whether you live in one of these equity investment eligible communities. If you're an employer, you can go there to post jobs and see if you can connect with equity eligible persons that you would like to hire. Um, so we're really excited about this. Right now, um, that platform is live. We will be adding more resources to it as um, you know our programs develop. So uh, keep checking back to it to see um, what new things have been added. And we really encourage everyone who's eligible to go and, and sign up to get certified as an equity eligible person. Next slide. Um, the third element of um, what we're required to do now to um, kind of uh, incorporate equity is on um, transparency and, and kind of accountability on this, getting more data out there about what's going on in the Illinois clean energy economy. So we now are required to um, collect information on demographic and geographic attributes of the project workforce. Um, for all of our uh, programs and our utility scale, um, our utility scale projects. Um, so we are collecting that right now as part two project application, and that should say in ABP, and we are in the process of incorporating it into our solar for all project application process as well. Um, and then we'll be reporting on that data annually. Um, and incorporating that as a way to kind of track how we're doing um, and whether this equity accountability system is uh, successful. Next slide. And then finally, we're going to be conducting a racial disparity study uh, next year. Um, we have to start with a baseline study um, of how the uh, current equity provisions are, are working. Then we'll do a broader study of just um, the entire clean energy uh, sector in Illinois to measure the presence and impact of discrimination on minority businesses and workers. Um, and then based on what we find, um, we are authorized to adjust all of the requirements that I just talked about to better uh, reach the policy objectives stated in CJA. Next slide. So I think I might gloss over these. Basically, they're um, prevailing wage requirements um, that ensure that all of these jobs that these equity eligible persons are going to get are actually, um, you know, well-paying jobs that are attractive. Um, so all of the utility scale projects and all of the pro projects participating in an adjustable block program. Um, must pay prevailing wage. There's two um, exceptions to that, and that is for residential projects or for houses of worship. Um, and next slide, we also have a requirement specifically for, sorry, next slide, please. 
We also have this requirement specifically for um, utility scale projects that those projects must also be built under a project labor agreement, which is another layer of protection and ensuring that these are um, good jobs that provide um, good work environments and benefits. Next slide. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Lisa. We are running low on time, so hopefully everyone can either stay a little over or maybe we can answer questions in the chat, my guy. I'm not sure how you'd like to. Yeah, we can go ahead and go with Lisa. And again, uh, we have provided contact information of all the speakers. So if anyone has any additional questions um, that are not answered in the chat already, um, please feel free to reach out to the speakers directly. Lisa, the floor is yours. Great, thanks everyone. And this has been some great information. I've uh, even learned a lot as uh, being new to the energy space myself. So uh, we've been working for over a year now to stand up the CJA workforce and contractor programs. And just as uh, Delmar was talking about the act and how collaborative it was in nature and really thinking about all of um, taking all of the stakeholders into account. We've done the same thing in our approach with the CJA workforce uh, program. And there's, as you'll see on our screen, and as Delmar alluded to, we do have the seven different programs that we've been working on standing up the Clean Jobs Workforce Program, um, which is going to be in 13 hub sites across the state. Um, the goal is really going to be uh, preparing folks for entry-level clean energy jobs. The second workforce program, the Climate Works Pre-Apprenticeship, is three hubs um, across the state, looking at training to prepare people for careers in the construction and building trades and clean energy jobs. Um, and then we've got another program, workforce program, the Returning Residents Clean Energy Jobs, which um, is going to be working with um, individuals that are, are leaving um, the Department of Corrections custody. And then while it's not represented on here, I also wanted to mention that at DCEO, we also oversee the three uh, workforce programs that were under FEJA, the Craft Apprenticeship, the Multicultural Jobs, and the Solar Pipeline Training Programs. The Craft Apprenticeship and Solar Pipeline, we actually have up and going, and the Multicultural Jobs Program, uh, we are getting ready to um, stand up four of the categories that were in the program, and then we have a, a funding opportunity out uh, for a category uh, specifically dealing with youth, and then also for um, an organization um, that has um, experience in economic development. And with all of the programs, um, you know, just as we've talked about earlier with the equity-focused uh, populations, um, it's the same with these programs. Those are the folks that will be eligible to be served under the program. Um, the support programs that we're working on are the Energy Transition Navigator Program and the Barrier Reduction Program. And then um, supporting uh, also are the Contractor Incubator and the Contractor Accelerator, um, which the Clean Energy Contractor Incubator Program is going to be 13 hubs to deliver training, mentorship, and recruitment for small clean energy businesses. And then the Prime Contractor Accelerator Program is really going to be looking at providing resources to expand capacity for prime contractors uh, related to clean energy projects. If you could uh, flip to the next slide. Sorry, Mega. Thanks. Okay. Um, on two of our, actually three, the Clean Jobs, uh, two programs, sorry, the Clean Jobs Curriculum Development, this is required in the legislation on two of the workforce programs. It's required for the Clean uh, Jobs Workforce Network Program and also the Returning Residence Program. We have been um, working on that curriculum. This was a broad stakeholder engagement process that we undertook throughout all of the fall of last year. Um, we did uh, summarize the findings, which are available on our web website, if anybody's interested in the findings. Um, we have also um, doing some intense stakeholder engagement around the Returning Residents Clean Jobs Program as well. And as we finish that up, we will be doing, um, posting those results for your information. Next slide, please. 
I'm trying to go through these quickly, sorry. And as I mentioned, uh, our robust research and stakeholder engagement uh, process, uh, these are on our website, the Clean Energy Jobs and Training Program Inventory. That inventory uh, was really focused around what the entry level clean jobs were um, out there and what we wanted to focus on as a starting place for the framework development. And I think it's important to point out that what we're really doing, while it's called a curriculum, we're really focusing on a framework. Um, in par as part of that landscape for the training report inventory, you'll see that there are a lot of programs already out there um, that just may need to be fine-tuned. So we were really looking at where the gaps were um, and, so, and where could we strengthen and really um, dig into creating um, their proper curriculum for the clean jobs report. And then the stakeholder feedback, um, just to mention how robust it was, we actually had um, uh, of all of our sessions that we had, we had 145 community-based organizations attend. And we had 98 training providers. Um, we had 60 businesses. Um, and we also had 161 individuals that uh, completed a survey. And from that, it became, we had so much engagement with that stakeholder engagement process um, and so much interest that we actually now also have an ongoing advisory council that Delmore sits on um, with us to kind of help us keep us going, um, you know, helping us inform um, additional uh, curriculum development as we need it. So that's going to be something that we're going to be doing ongoing. And to get into, if you want to go to the next slide, Mega, um, to get a little bit about the framework status. So right now we do have some of the framework uh, drafted. We've been working very closely with the community college board and the community college system on this framework to make sure that we're complementing existing programs and that we're not du duplicating any programs. Um, employers have been a big part of providing us with feedback and training providers. Um, we're looking at a mid-March completion date for that. If you wanna go to the next slide. Um, the next slide, these are some specific training options that we're starting with. Um, and, th and this is the, the ones that are under development. And as you'll see on the screen, three of these training options are also options that are currently available in the prison. And so these will be ones that I think we'll start with on the returning residents job program. And if you wanna go to the next slide, Mega. Um, all of the training that we'll be doing, and I should um, emphasize that this is really for the clean jobs workforce network hub that the curriculum development is for it is not for the climate pre-apprenticeship the climate works pre-apprenticeship program um, but we're looking at um, these industry recognized credentials or certifications and i don't really I, you can see what those are on the screen without really going through them um, if you want to go to the next slide thanks and I mentioned this a little bit, but in addition to um, the, the stakeholder engagement and listening sessions we had, um, we've also done um, some program design um, in stakeholder engagement through the request for information process. And as you can see, um, we did do one for the Climate Works Pre-Apprenticeship uh, that closed on November 3rd. We've done the Contractor Incubator Program um, the re and Clean Jobs Network. Um, the Prime Contractor Accelerator is the current request for information that we have available. So if you all would like to get on our website um, and take a look at that and provide information, we'd certainly love for you to do that. If you wanna go to the next slide, we're gonna talk about in these next few slides quickly, I hope, um, on what's kind of been going on and where we're heading. So I did mention the returning resident program design and curriculum feedback. Been working closely with the Department of Corrections. Um, we've had two listening sessions specifically on the returning resident program um, that included training providers, community-based organizations, and um, employers. Uh, we are next week actually gonna have two more sessions. And then again, as I mentioned, we'll summarize those findings and share them on our website. Next slide, please. After um, all of the work that we've been doing this last year, and I know lots of folks have been anxious 
to get our programs up and going, we are on a, we finally have like a timeline for rollout, at least for the release of the funding opportunities. We're currently reviewing the Climate Works pre-apprenticeship program, uh, getting ready to release that. We're hoping in mid-March. Um, so we're doing some final fine tuning on the Climate Works pre-apprenticeship NOFO funding opportunity. Um, the contractor incubator would be the next one that we will release. Uh, April, we're looking at the clean jobs workforce hubs, the energy transition navigator, and the energy barrier reduction all being released. Um, and since those have so much overlap, we're also trying to think through what's the best way to release those funding opportunities to make sure that we avoid duplication and that they really are complementary to each other and that they roll out and um, are implemented in the way they were designed to be. And then of course, uh, finally in May, we'll be doing the returning residents and clean jobs program um, funding opportunity along with the contractor accelerator. Next slide, please. What we've been doing, the other thing that uh, became really clear to us um, through all of the stakeholder engagement that we did in listening sessions and hearing from um, the uh, stakeholders is creating a, a, a process where folks could come to, that they had to come for as a resource. And so to kick that off, uh, we recently just held two planning workshops for potential, potential applicants. And as you can see, we had great participation in both of those planning workshops. And then as the funding opportunities are rolled out, we're gonna continue um, that technical support um, through having bidders webinars. Um, we're also going to have um, proposal preparation workshops. And then, um, you know, in those workshops on the proposal uh, proposal preparation are going to be things as um, simple as how do you actually apply online for a state funded program using the uh, GATA program, which is the uh, Accountability and Transparency Act portal. Um, and then some additional technical support. So if you're a first time applicant, because one of the things that I think is really important in this process is, is expanding cap capacity of um, organizations to be able to access this funding, right? So when we're talking about creating equitable access, that is even in the provider organization space, right? So those um, organizations that don't traditionally come in for funding, we really want them to be able to access this funding to serve customers um, as well and, uh, oh, excuse me, to serve customers as well. If you wanna go on to the next slide. Just gonna go over a little bit, um, particularly where uh, the Climate Works hubs um, are concerned. And as part of those workshops, we gave a couple of possible options, as you can see. And this was one option when thinking about applying for um, a network hub was where the main grantee would provide all of the program elements. And you saw in the sl earlier slide where we went over what, what those elements were gonna look like, where we're talking about job readiness, we're looking at clean energy, talking about specific occupational training and the pre-assessment process that's gonna lead up to like enrolling in those services and what wraparound supports are they gonna need? So this was one example that we gave in the pre-planning workshop um, as a, something for communities to think about when you're thinking, when you're wanting to apply for this program. If you want to go on to the next slide. Um, the second one was looking at a model that um, there's a main grantee, but there's sub grant subcontracting with other organizations to deliver program elements. And as you can see on the slide, we've even given um, a suggestion of how that might look. If you want to go on to the next slide. Uh, and finally, and I think this is really the important thing, is thinking about in your community how, what you need to do to go about applying for your funding. You know, what's your team? How, how is that going to look? If we really want to go after um, a hub, say, in the Rockford area, what are the community-based organizations? What are our who are our employer partners? Who are our community college and education partners that we need um, to, to get involved in the application process? What are the local needs? What kind of research is currently out there that we can build on? Delmar gave us a lot of great resources earlier in the power hour that would help support that. 
what are those? And then I already kind of mentioned, but also like, what are those employer partnerships and how do we, how do we go about um, engaging employers in our application process? Next slide, please. And then what's your program design look like? Outreach and recruitment. I think, you know, Delmar alluded to this earlier in his, um, in his discussion around, are you reaching those, you know, populations in indigenous, indigenous Oh, I'm not even going to say that word, black and brown communities. Um, if you're not, how do we go about that? How do we go about engaging those communities? Um, what's our application and intake process going to look like um, for recruit, not just for recruiting, but once we get customers in the door, do we have a streamlined application process? What kinds of pre-assessments do we need? Um, what's our staffing plan? How many folks do we need to actually be able to serve um, the population in our community? Um, and then just real quickly looking at what's our tra training program delivery. As I mentioned, while we're doing a curriculum framework, there's also other programs that are out there. Um, and what's going to be the referral mechanism to get those, get to those appropriate programs? Um, what's the work-based learning look like? We, you know, really want to push um, not just sort of the sort of sit and get training, but also building in work-based learning opportunities along the way. And then, uh, on the transition and job placement, and then what's the wraparound support services that customers are going to need to remain successful in those positions? And then if you want to go to the next slide. Employer engagement. Um, I've talked about it a few times already, but employer engagement is, is really critical to the design and the success um, of these programs and ultimately um, in ensuring uh, it, individuals are getting access and being successful in these clean energy jobs. And we've done several um, employer engagement events. As you can see, we ha hosted one with Ameren um, for solar employers. IFEA hosted that. And then we are on March 1st um, going to be doing an all employer meeting as well. And if you want to go to the next slide. Um, our employer engagement events, these have been some of the topics, you know, are they hiring? How do, how do you want to grow your business? Take advantage of the contractor program. How can you, how do you want to be involved? And then there's a breakout discussion um, in these employer engagement events. And the overall timeline, and I think this is my last slide, um, as I kind of talked about, the curriculum development's ongoing in March, employer engagement's going to kind of finish up in March. Um, the release of our funding opportunities uh, for pre-apprenticeship and contractor incubator um, happening in March, and then um, the others in, in April with ending in May with the returning resident and prime, and prime contractor programs. And then, of course, our application workshops, applicant workshops and support are going to be happening along the way. So. Um, I think that's the end of my slides, Megan. Um, thank you. I'm so sorry that I went over so long, but I do really appreciate the opportunity to share the programs and happy to take questions. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, all speakers. We apologize for taking additional time, but this is great content. And um, <clears throat> I think we're answering a lot of the questions uh, already on the chat, but if you have any additional questions, please do reach out to the speakers. Their contact information is provided on the slide, and the IPA will be um, posting the recording of this webinar and the presentation um, soon, and we will be making an announcement on our website when that happens. So on behalf of the IPA, I would like to thank everyone for joining the session. We hope it was helpful, and see you on March 3rd. 31st for the next power hour. Bye-bye.